I should probably clarify this and state that this chart is the culmination of all the shafts I've tested over the years, not just what's available today. And with the consolidation in the golf industry and fewer shafts being manufactured, you won't quite see near this much range, but there's still a wide range out there. Plus, there's no standardization on the part of the manufacturers. Part of the explanation of why you see such great ranges is that this helps in creating unique shafts, as there are many different philosophies on shaft designs. And if not, we'd be all playing essentially the same thing, or the same types of shafts. But as you could see from the frequency uh, uh, standpoint, at least on this chart, there's a lot of flex overlap. And in the worst cases, you see X-flex shafts, at least labeled X-flex shafts, that are more flexible than what an L-flex shaft is. In the end, the generic letter designations tell us very little. Now there's another reason why the flex of shafts are not all the same, and that comes down to the weight of the shaft. One really should compare one shaft to another in the same weight range and material. This slide shows you the relationship between S-flex steel 5-iron shafts. I remember years ago when the first really lightweight steel shafts came on the market. In an attempt to make them the same stiffness as their heavier counterparts, they always felt boardy or unresponsive. But over the years, the amount of flex in a design has been more performance driven than trying to target a specific frequency number. The more successful lightweight steel shafts have become progressively more flexible or I should say, possess a lower frequency as they become lighter and lighter. Some of these 75 gram steel shafts may appear on paper to be two or three flexes softer, but you put them in play without any preconceived notions and they perform as the letter flex designation would indicate. Now I mentioned earlier that one of the roles of the shaft was to provide some trajectory change. Well, this is often done by the geometry of the shaft and why you see different step patterns and parallel tip lengths on steel shafts or in graphite shafts they are made from various materials and laid up at different angles. Well, since the butt end is larger than the tip end, it only makes sense that the maximum point of bending on a shaft will be located below the midsection of the shaft. Now, there's a few different um, tests to measure the bend profile or at least the point of maximum bending on a shaft. And for years, bend point was used to describe the, uh, um, how the shaft might launch the ball. The assumption was the higher the bend point, the lower the ball flight. Well, to measure bend point, the shaft um, was clamped at both ends and then compressed. And this would create the bow. And the point of maximum bending was the bend point. Kick point is slightly different. This is where the butt end is clamped, like if you were holding the, the grip um, end of the club. And then a force or a load is applied to the tip. And if you drew a straight line from these two points, the position where the maximum uh, deviation occurred is called the kick point. In more recent years, we've been more interested in the deflection along the uh, entire length of the shaft. And by using a three-point bend test, the engineers can analyze the stiffness distribution entire, uh, along the entire length of a golf shaft. And then this data could be fed to the computer and plotted to replicate the deflection curve. And then um, the shafts could be analyzed side by side for comparative purposes, and, and then the launch conditions correlated to robot data. should be noted that the, the point of maximum bending, whether it's the bend point or kick point test, is the same no matter what the force is. Only the amplitude or the amount of deflection or curvature changes. So shafts had to have multiple bend or kick points depending on how hard you swing the club 
is impossible. Plus, the point of maximum bending is in a, a fairly narrow range on the shaft, not the wide range that uh, many might think. Now, bend point and kick point have, it, have been defined um, as the slide shows here. One, a high bend point or kick point shaft has a firm tip. Let me, okay, has a firm tip and a flexible butt section. A low bend point or low kick shaft has a weak tip and a firm butt section. And a mid bend point or mid kick point shaft falls somewhere in between. Well, just like the flex of the shaft, there's no universal testing method adopted by the golf industry. Plus, there's overlap from what one manufacturer might call low bend or low kick shaft to what another might consider mid. And lastly, the measurements are typically only made on raw and cut shafts. So what happens when the shaft is cut? Well, in reality, graphite shaft designers can make the butt stiff, the tip stiff, and the middle section weaker, and it wouldn't fall into any of these categories. Uh, this is all possible by applying different materials in specific locations and at different angles on the shaft forming mandrel. Today, the companies will usually indicate the trajectory relative to, their, uh, to other shafts within their own line. The key there is their own line based on launch monitor and or robot data, which is a far better system, but it still does not accurately compare shafts from multiple manufacturers. Even so, shafts are swung by humans, often with unique swings. The position where the unloading of the shaft takes place in relationship to the impact with the ball, as well as how far rearward the center of gravity of the club head is, controls the trajectory and even face angle more so than a single maximum point of bending that occurs on a golf shaft. Now, up next is the uh, term torque, and it's a measure of how much resistance there is to twisting. Now, technically, it's the wrong terminology, but uh, those within the golf industry have used it so long, this is simply what we refer it to. Torque is also the m most misunderstood of the shaft terms. Most people assume that low torque is better, and that may not always be the case. The right amount of torque can help square up the face at impact. Torque is simply measured by clamping, usually the butt end, and applying a one foot pound force to the tip and record how many degrees of, uh, of twist occurred. And that's all it is. Uh, once again, there's no universal method of measuring adopted by all the manufacturers. Some will clamp more of the tip than others, and so there's no way of looking at that one manufacturer's pub published data and confidently comparing it to another manufacturer's uh, torque listings. I should also say that torque does exist in steel, but it cannot be independently changed like graphite shafts can. Usually the weight and stiffness primarily control what the torque of a steel shaft could be. And the reason why you really don't see uh, the manufacturers listing it or that information uh, being published in the component suppliers catalogs or on their websites. Now a few years ago we were designing one of our house brand graphite shafts using an existing model. We had substituted two layers of the longitudinal layers, which control the flex of the shaft, for two layers of bias ply material to reduce the torque. We also substituted um, uh, some higher modulus material, or just a fancy uh, term for high strength, in order to compensate for the lack of stiffness by changing the fiber orientation. When we look closely at these two models, the weight, the flex, and the geometry of these shafts were identical. The only thing we did was we altered the torque and added a couple layers of different material, which completely changed the trajectory, 